Here we are, folks, revolts, continuing our long march through and way past the um, fabulous unpublished novel called The Fox about uh, this mythical uh, East Side rock group of the 60s. And uh, the Fox have just completed their uh, first professional performance where at least 12 people were in the audience, including uh, Kentucky Killam, a famous Southern playwright. The gay, you know, the gay Alcohol. guy. Yeah, who fell asleep during the show and really had the best time he ever had sleeping on a bench. And uh, 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 Red Blaze, the commander, Captain Captain Red, we used to call him, uh, formulated, didn't exactly like the way the discipline of the group, and he formulated this uh, resume of how the band should behave. And we're going to look at that now. Code of, code of conduct. Yeah. A uniform. Oh, During the performance, the audience should be faced as much as possible. What a disgusting <laughs> thought. Two yawning, narcolepsy sleeping, board side should be repressed. Actually, you're allowed to eat though. The fugs must put on, at every instance, an energetic output. Energy, interest, and excitement are important keys to successful performances. Three. Yeah. Immediately following the tuning after songs, unless inspired by irresistible urge to create genius, instrument playing should be either very low or not at all. This will cause the show pace to be much more brisk. Four. The ending of songs should be very precise. Many of the fug songs sort of end in trailing stages so that the audience doesn't quite know when a number is over. This should be remedied. I don't know about that. Drum practice should not occur during intermission. Performers should be prepared to play precisely at the minute schedule for the show to begin in synonym. When it is agreed that a certain vocal arrangement will be used, an attempt should be made at every performance to sing said arrangement. Perfection should be worshipped. Arrangements should proceed through slight and ever-improving modification toward the uh. absolute arrangement. Oh, yeah. A moment of silence. Uh, no, don't rip it up. <laughs> this is chapter four now, called The Painted Turd. You all remember what it's named after, right? It's that uh, phony, uh, the phony's book called The Painted Word. Forget his name. Uh, you remember Red Blaze is the leader of the group, Yuri Yankovic is among the other people, and we always eat during the show. Red Blaze led the troop of fucks and their wives, boards, and hangers on slowly up the inclined ramp into the fabled quarters of Anatole Asshole, the new rage artist of the day. Anatole's headquarters were in an old stable in the East 30s. The place had been rechristened D. Livery. The huge dark single room was entered through a narrow stall with straw on the floor and a strange smell, which Yuri recognized instantly as a pleasant blend of fresh piss and old horseshit. He wondered where they got the fresh piss from. The place was packed full, strobes were flashing, and strange noises were coming from an improvised stage in the center. All around the stripped brick walls were huge hangings of Anatole's latest works. The Body Fluid Series, it was called. Starting from one corner, there was the sputum triptych plane in one panel, barely visible shine on a gray background, and the second, a green and white composition called Madama Influenza, and on the far right, a frothy red and white antipasto of high relief substances termed simply TBC, that is tuberculosis. 
The next painting, very longitudinal and a thick Rococo gilt frame, consisted of a series of about 20 white handkerchiefs in several stages of unfolding to which a wide variety of boogers had been attached, some still veritably glistening. Yuri wondered how this state had been maintained and was told later by Chester Fields that Amy, as he was nicknamed, had developed a special kind of fixative out of a mixture of Manischewitz white wine and old dog urine. Yuri's ears were now attracted to a sort of hissing sound, and in another corner of the room he found a marvelous mobile called Painter's Pissoir, an ingenious motorized waterfall raised the yellow-looking fluid up a series of catchment rollers to a 15-foot high height, 15-foot height where the fluid dropped in gentle arc, illuminated by a floodlight placed beneath into a large white urinal into which the viewing public, male and female, were invited to contribute a sample. Ben Wooza tried it but complained of getting drenched in a fine piss spray. <laughs> And there were no women contributors. Emily, Abe's chick, complained that there was no seat for women and the whole idea stunk of machismo. Scattered at random throughout the whole floor, Arnold surrounded by peeling old saddles, were huge gold and silver sculpted models of human turds. Some as high as seven feet or more, and some as wide as three feet around, and piled to a circling mass of over a yard high. Ben was once more amazed at the genius of human variety, and said a soft fundamentalist prayer of thanksgiving to himself, while tilting back a huge slug of Harper and Brothers Kentucky bourbon. Just above a flashing strobe near the toilet, Blaze gazed with envy at two works titled, one was called Red November, a collage of used Kotex and wads of bloodied cotton on unfinished plywood, and another called Birth of a Nation, consisting of seven scumbags in various states of deterioration with what looked like real sperm bubbling over from several. Two obviously had broken at the tip and were dripping babies toward the bottom of the frame. He nudged Mildred, his mysterious wife. That's art, he said, and it sells for seven grand a spurt. Excuse me. All the hanging pieces were covered with asshole's trademark. Sheets of clear, glossy plastic. So were the entire walls, ceiling, and floor done in vast sheets of the same hypnotic, vertiginous substance. Anatole himself, standing near the front window, smoking and his plastic pink-colored glasses had another layer of his transparo, as he called it, glued on top of their lenses. He turned slowly as Red approached. Hi, Anatole, said Red. Great party. How's the chef, Cardi Har? Anatole smiled weakly. Mildred Blaze poked Red in the ribs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Anatole, my wife, Mildred. Anatole gazed at a delicate, shy, brown curled creature wearing a plastic veil from her eyes down to the bottom of her neck. She wore a gold lame skirt and a tight silver blouse, cut so low that the tops of her sweet cherry nipples popped out occasionally, and she had to embarrassingly keep shoving them back. Anatole turned and introduced his director, Paul Maul, that was spelled M-A-U-L, and one of his new actresses, Old Gold, a stout intense woman in her 50s. The talk turned to the movie they were planning to make, to make together, that is Anatole and the Fox, about a rodeo road company stuck in Vietnam 
and involved with opium smuggling and the NLF. And that would be National a Liberation Front, the, uh, the commies. What were they called? Kong. Uh, the Kong, or oh, the Gooks, you remember that. Viet Kung. <laughs> Viet Kung's, right. Me, that's what they were called. Well, they held a contest to have the worst sounding name in South Vietnam. Really? And the winner of the contest was Kung. Kung. Yeah, they, they know what they were doing, those, uh, our leaders, or the mis, mis leaders. Meanwhile, Yuri, having drunk deeply of the LSD punch being siphoned out of a horse trough, or trow, if you like, by the ladleful, by a cute brunette asshole groupie called Virginia Slim, whom Yuri had goosed several times, causing a great floor loss of punch, and needing to heed an urgent call of nature, Yuri headed reelingly toward the toilet. The plaster walls of the toilet had been hacked away and covered instead with the transparent plastic so that Quote, the truth shall be revealed, as the sign that hung over the toilet's entrance stated. Yuri waited his turn and watched in fascination as the tall, beautiful Asian model took a crap in the transparent toilet bowl. And Alex Rayburn, the infamous laundry list poet of St. Mark's, that's M-A-R-X, church. As Alex Rayburn uh, fucked in a convincing manner, Helen of Troy, New York. Rick Tawney, the fucks bass player's very nubile girlfriend, that Helen was actually. Alex was fuck, fucked her, standing up in the shower stall behind the transparent parent curtains twice. Yuri finally sat down wearily and started to strain. Here I sit, broken hearted, Paid a quarter and only farted. He got up and was just starting to pull up his pants when flash, someone snapped his photo. Rex Wrestler, the fucks photographer, had brought his Polaroid and was selling colored toilet shots at $2.75 each. Grumbling, he forked over the money and as soon as the wrestler turned, ripped the photo to shreds. No one was going to blackmail Yuri Yankovic. He turned toward the banister to the bandstand where the satin assholes were now swinging into their wind-up number, Cherry Cola Blues. Their drummer, Babe Dietrich, a sex changeur of unknown origin or destination, had a transparent bass drum, which he, question mark, was playing attached by some elaborate metal contraption to the top of her head. He also affected a 25-cent plastic devil mask from Woolworths. The drum was a striking effect, but detracted somewhat from the lead female singer. The stunning crow-haired persona of mixed Persian-Siamese extraction called Icon. Icon was completely nude except for a long, thick green snake which she twisted suggestively around her breasts and inserted at various times into her mouth, vagina, or at the very climax of the song, into her asshole, which had a thick patch of black satin completely surrounding it. Thus the satin assholes. Cherry cola, she sang. Cherry cola, cherry cola, cherry cola. Up my hola, cherry cola, up my hola, life's a bola, cherry cola, up my hola, up my hola, up my hola, life's a bola, cherry cola. The lights came up and Icon got into a dressing gown and walked off the stage <laughs> to a mild scattering of applause and a sharp whistle from a small woman in the back. The lights went dim again and someone put on a tape of the fuck's latest album. The strobes went on full tit. Virginia Slim poured a pint of vodka and a gallon of PVC horse tranquilizer into the punch and the party rocked on. It was a great party. 
and it was a great party, and several bodies were already stacked unevenly in the corner near the toilet. Yuri, by now racked out of his mind from the sunshine LSD in the punch bowl, rolled over to the movie makers group where Red seemed to be having some disagreement over the ideology of the forthcoming flick. Asshole was saying, Red, we agreed to call the combined groups the fucking satin assholes. Okay. But I've got to be firm about Paul's point. They cannot be on the side of the Viet Cong. They've got to be Democrats, or at the most, and if we decide to make them a hillbilly band, they can be populist, but... Listen, asshole! Red interrupted. The future of humanity is at stake. When are you fucking asexuals going to realize that? Which side are you on? To which Anatole replied, raising his voice slightly. Neither. I don't have to choose. I cultivate my garden. At this point, a huge uproar was heard at the punch trough, and after rocking a while back and forth, the whole trough went down with a terrific rumble, clatter, splash, drenching Virginia Slim and Ben Moose in a gooey mixture of scotch, rum, vodka, LSD sunshine, PVC, atropine, tiger balm, fool's gold, razor blades, watermelon, stramonium detura, and cherry cola. Fox! Hey, Rube! Ben shouted. Hey, Rube! Hey, Rube! Hey, Rube! And the fucks roused themselves in immediate pandemonium to defend their comrade who was being pummeled by various cigarette brands racing in from around the loft. What the fuck happened? Screamed Red. Oh, they caught Ben pouring a whole bottle of alka cells into the punch, said Yuri, jumping as Virginia Slim goosed him. A whole bottle... Red side ducking as a clear plastic trumpet mute came sailing off the bandstand. Six tablets would have been enough. The exit lights were doused by an unknown hand, and the battle raged fitfully for a short period with several feminine type screams of passion piercing the strobe infested night. The door to the ramp was pushed open to reveal a blaze of daylight at the end of the tunnel. The outnumbered fuckhorde walked fast, some running, maneuvering themselves out with some dignity. Yuri, the last, was trying to shut the door to pursuers when Two feet of shit sculpture hit him in the face and then dropped with a clay-like thud to the floor. Yuri rushed to reach the others and wiping his eyebrows and cheek and passing his hands over his nose hissed. Shit! It's real! Just then already outside on the sidewalk another huge clump of shit sculpture dropped from the first floor, brushed Red's wave coiffure and draped itself over his right shoulder, started dripping down vaguely over his new scarlet trousers and his white suede shoes. He looked up to see the devilish cherubic Anatole smiling gently at the window. Red shook his fist fiercely. You, 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 Warhol! Uh, so that ends chapter uh, four.